We want to talk <clears throat> this hour uh, about mating behavior of bees with a focus on drone congregation areas, but also on some of the aspects of queen biology after mating. This has become of great concern to us over the years. You know, it wasn't too many years ago. There are people in this room, myself being included, that we thought that queens only mated with one or two drones. And of course, back in, uh, before the Queen Elizabeth number one, it was thought that the queen was a drone, was a, was a king, and he ruled the hive. Man, have we gone a long way from that. So I've been fortunate over the last a year and a half, two years, to work with uh, some folks. I thought I had another slide here. Oh, there it is, that's what. This couple right here, Gundren and uh, Nicholas Kroeninger, uh, both doctors, PhDs, uh, German system research, very intense, very, uh, very uh, intellectual pursuits. Uh, Nicholas was the director of the B Lab at Oberursel for a number of years. Uh, some of you know a student from Oberursel. You don't know this. But you, if you know John Kiefus, he graduated from this program in Germany uh, while dating a woman from France. So he was trying to learn German and learn France, French. And he would say France. So anyway, uh, Gundren, also with a PhD, she raised the family learned how to climb ropes, look at Apis Cersata 200 feet up in the air, and has done a lot of work on mating behavior. The two of them wrote a book about the bees of Borneo, <clears throat> which is a beautiful color book, and we forgot to bring one, but <clears throat> there are five species of Apis in Borneo, five. How many species of Apis do we have? Come on, we're gonna, we're gonna have to work on this. <laughs> Dwight, how many species of apis do we have in North America? One. Okay, what's that, what's it called? Mellifera. Apis mellifera, yeah. So when people talk about Italian and Carniolan, what are they talking about? Subspecies or races, yeah, okay which are isolated you know, genetically over time so that they, they have their own set of rules, if you will. So the, the Kernigers have written a beautiful book in German about this area of uh, mating behavior, and it's about that thick. So we came up with the English translation. We left out one thing. We left out the German rules about bee breeding. And that says a lot about our differences in culture. The Germans have very formalized rules about where you can put your bees, what stocks you can put in different locations. Is this cutting out? And so you've got a different approach. So the Kernigers approached me about publishing this book and then it evolved into working with Dr. Jamie Ellis at the University, at, at, uh, Florida, you know, University of Florida in Gainesville. And Jamie Ellis and the Kernigers have been working on a, a new molecule, molecule for mite control. So it was convenient to talk to them. And then um, I signed on. So between the four of us, we put this book out um, about, it, what, last fall, I think. I got these men crawling all over me here. <laughs> He's smiling. All right, so let's talk about drone and queen sex. So, drone congregation areas, DCAs, why do they exist? Well, I'll give you the answer. It avoids inbreeding. Drone congregation areas are unique, not unique, but there are very few other animals that have such a, an amazing phenomenon. And this whole thing about inbreeding, we, we don't understand very well. 
We have a lot of different things that are going on inside the beehive when it comes to the genetics. And those of you that have studied a little bit about bee genetics, you know that unlike mammals, sex is determined by a gene. So if you're haploid or diploid for a particular organ, uh, gene, can influence your sex, some of the drones. The drones are haploid. The workers, the two casts, the workers and the queens, are diploid. They have two sets of chromosomes. So one of the things that we see is that when we get two sets of chromosomes with the same allele, okay, you say, what the hell is an allele? How many know what an allele is? Better than I thought. All right, you all have a blood type, right? How many A's do we have in here? How many B's? How many O's? Oh, God, we got a lot of donors. Uh, how many Z's? Just checking if you, you know, <laughs> pay it. <laughs> if you just go along for the right answer. Those are alleles. Those are human alleles for blood type. So here's a different mechanism for honeybees. We have alleles for sex determination. If you have the same allele for a diploid individual, it's a drone that is soon after that drone egg hatches, the worker bees eat it. They carry it out. They destroy it. And if, you're la if you, ra you raise these drones out in the laboratory, they basically aren't any good. So it's, it's Mother Nature's way of, uh, of kind of cleaning up a little byproduct of this haploid, diploid mechanism. So spotty brood is one of the things you see. You also see spotty brood from what? Laying workers, wrong, wrong answer. Poorly mated, wrong answer. Hygienic behavior, thank you. Stand up, I can't see who's talking. I got lights. Thank you, thank you very much. Spot, uh, spotty brood is not caused by poor mating and it's not caused by drone layers. I'm glad you guys thought that it was, because it's not. It's caused by this, this one of two things, either the inbreeding or hygienic behavior. Hygienic behavior, do the bees remove it because it's diploid? No, they remove it because it's diseased. So Marla Spivak, Gary Reuter, University of Minnesota have shown that the removal of larvae by the bees is due to, and, that, and they'll remove a mite, American or European fowl brood, which is bacteria, sac brood, or chalk brood. So you've got several different organism types here. You've got a parasite, a bacteria, a couple of bacteria, a fungus, and a virus, which is pretty unique. That's why we think the bees are so clever, because they use a behavior to fix a problem rather than a, a single gene mutation like a mosquito might. And that's a, an aspect of the social nature of bees. All right. So diploid drone larvae, whoops, I'm just trying to get the pointer. Pointer doesn't work. Okay, lower line, diploid drone larvae are eaten as soon as they hatch, causing this body pattern. So this is why we have DCAs. Well, we're not quite there yet. <clears throat> the other aspect of inbreeding, back in the 1970s, I ran the Starline Midnight Program for the Daydant family and Harvey York. Harvey York, of course, was a large queen producer in South Georgia. And they conspired with uh, some large honey producers and queen uh, producers. Uh, George Curtis in South Florida was a big cooperator. Uh, Richard Aidey was one of our officers. Uh, 
I think he's still the world's largest, uh, the family, still the largest beekeeping operation. And we found that inbred colonies weren't as strong or as vigorous as, as outcross colonies. So it isn't just this spotty brood. It's the lack of vigor. Smaller or larger colonies, so you want large colonies, so they're healthier, more likely to survive. Steve Tabor, bless his perverted soul, real, real bright man with, you know, if you fell asleep right now, he'd be throwing things at you. He'd take my shoe off and throw it at you to wake you up. So stay awake. The ghost of Steve Tabor is here right now. Steve Tabor said that all Britain bred queens want to do is die. Think about that. If the queen wants to die, colony's not going to fare very well. So we want to avoid inbreeding. That's the point of this whole work up here. Mother Nature wants to avoid inbreeding. And if you look at the left-hand side, you see what you get with an unfertilized egg, a single allele. There you see the sex locus. So there's a chromosome, we're missing the E. Our German-English translation didn't come out completely right. Then you have these fertilized, diploid individuals. And here's the key thing. When you have different patterns, all these here on the right-hand side are female. But the one there with the two red dots, the two red sex locus, though that's a male. That's a diploid male. So it's another way of saying what I've been trying to say here. And we're trying to avoid all of this. Now, most other insects don't have drone congregation areas. Bumblebees, oh, my God, they'll mate right in front of you. Totally indiscriminate. Uh, this is off the internet, and I don't know who took the photo, so I apologize if you took it. And thank you. Uh, great shot. I just want you to notice the mites on the female. One of the biggest problems with bumblebees are, you know, nest mites. We have nest mites and honeybees. Now, not necessarily being parasites, they're just there. So you can have bumblebees and other non-apis species mating in your lab. Uh, you go out to a maple tree and they're mating right there in front of you. Oh my God, it's so embarrassing. Bumblebees take it up in the air some distance away. They go to drone congregation areas where the queens know to go to get mated. And so the drones are located in a specific geographic location. And you're going to ask me, Dr. Connor, how, did, how can I set up a DCA? Well, bring bees in and see what happens. Sometimes the drone congregation area is right above your bee yard because these matings are taking up 100 to 200 feet up in the air. And one of the brilliant things from Dr. Debbie Delaney is showing, and other researchers are showing, that different races of honeybees may be mating at different altitudes, which is how they might keep their subspecies <laughs> purer, even though they're all flying at the same time. So they've, you could have a time shift to when they fly, and you could have a, you know, so they've got to, they've got to communicate how high, how far, and so forth to get to these DCAs. This is just mind-boggling stuff. It just amazes me how they are able to do this. So we're oh, 50 to 200 feet off the air. And in that area, there are drones patrolling, about 10,000 drones, plus or minus. For every two drones you have in a DCA, you've got one flying back and forth for refueling. So it takes a lot of drones to maintain a DCA. So Mary and Alice, Dr. Mary and Alice out in uh, Nebraska, he had some uh, soda company, uh, pop company, Coke or Pepsi, that you know, they had a contract with the University of Nebraska that only their vending machines would be on campus. And for that, they gave the university $10 million a year. There's no money in, in soda, a pop. 
he got some of that money and he'd hire students to go out every afternoon and fly a, a kite or a balloon. And there's a cage there. I don't know how well you can see it. It's kind of light in here. But there's a little cage with a little piece of cotton with queen pheromone on there. And they'd study where the drones are. And there are a few drones flying around there. But this was in a flyway and not in a DCA. And so mating can happen in flyways. So there, there are exceptions to the rule. All right. Next concept I want you to understand is that honeybees are the, one of the most asymmetrical, um, have one of the most asymmetrical reproductive rates. And that large queen, this is just, you know, thrown on there. Um, somebody had fun with Photoshop on this one and didn't do a really good job. But that one queen, on average, for every queen that a natural colony, a non-managed colony produces, you get about 2,000 drones being produced in a colony. 2,000 to one. Great odds for the ladies. Not so good for the guys. So your, your mating strategy is changed. Now, why would bees do that? Why would they put all their emphasis on drones and not on queens? Because they're social. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of beeswax, honey, pollen, to produce one colony of bees, because that's what we call swarms, right? For, for us to take and produce 2,000 queens, go out to your colony and envision dividing it into 2,000 pieces. Now, you might look on the ground and see an ant nest, and they might produce hundreds and hundreds of reproductive queens. And what's different between that ant nest and that queen, that honeybee colony? Every one of those ant, those queen, those, those female ants, the reproductive ants, can start a colony on her own. She doesn't need a swarm of worker bees to go with her. So that seems to be the the trade-off as, as social you know, behavior developed in honeybees, you've got this huge, huge diver, uh, difference in the reproductive strategy. Now, one of the things that the Kernikers spent a lot of time figuring out was that it takes a colony less energy, costs less honey, to send one queen a distance than to send 2,000 or more drones a distance away from the hive. Now, you got 2,000 drones. They might make four or five mating flights a day. Nice day like this, we should have good drone flight this afternoon. So these drones are going out. On average, they spend about 25 minutes in the DCA and then they run out of honey, they have to go back to the hive and refuel. Queen has to do the same thing. She goes out, she has to refuel. But it takes less energy to send the drones out, go out this door and go up 200 feet and that's it. As compared to go out here, fly a mile away, go up to 200 feet high, then you'll find your DCA. So energy use by honeybee colonies is thought to be one of the reasons why these DCAs are you know, asymmetrical in terms of the distribution of the males and the females. One queen goes out on, on average to these areas. Now, so we, we know that drones take about an average of 25 minutes, and they're making three to six flights. I said five, so it was close. And it's, you know, shorter days sometimes. Uh, so if, a, if a, the further the bees have to fly, the more energy, more energy they, they spend. For a drone, let's say they fly a mile away. If it takes 10 minutes, and that's probably what it takes a bee to fly a mile, about 10 minutes. You got 10 minutes out, 10 minutes back, 
25 minutes total, you got five minutes. Five minutes to patrol. Now look for a queen. Look at the clock. I've got to go back and refuel. So that's the other aspect. The flight, the, you know, the, the how long they could stay in the air. For a queen to go out, fly a mile, mate. Mating takes place very quickly. Under two seconds to mate with one drone. So she can, re, she can mate with her 15 drones. I don't know if I've said that yet, but the, that's the average we're working with right now. 15 drones in, the, in less than a minute. So if all those drones are in the DCA, they're sexually mature, that's the ones that are out there, healthy, that's the ones that are out there. They may be firing blanks, and that's because of something that's happened in nature or pesticide exposure. That's not their fault. When they come back, the uh, queens come back to the hive, and they've got the mating sign. So during the flow, these drones are being fed by the worker bees once the nectar flow is over. The, 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 the house bees don't have as much nectar in their stomach because they're not involved in ripening. The drone has to go to the cell, feed himself on honey for the next flight. So it takes longer for him to refuel. So he'd rather be fed than have to feed himself. Now how do we do some of that? These are some, some old images from the Kernigers. You can use traps, you can use nets. And these traps are designed, but you have to get up there. So you, you see the balloon at the top? Plastic bag, it's got helium in it. And you've got a queen pheromone on that, and that's on a fishing line. You bring it down, and now you get the drones that are behind the, the you can't see the cage. And you can start swooping up some of these drones. So you can sample some of the drones in these DCAs. And then somebody came up with a really cool trap. So you got a weather balloon, a trap where you can see the darker part of the top, those are drones. And there's a cage with pheromone in there. So the drones come up on that open part at the bottom and they fly up into the trap. And they could get out, get out, but their instinct is to fly up. So you can lower all this and sample this. Now, here's a great, here's a great thing to remember. You can sample those drones, you can mark those drones, and I'll show you that in just a minute. But you've got that 25 minute window. So you can't sample all 10,000 at once. And of course, there wouldn't be all 10,000 in there. Look at all those drones up there. So you sample all of them, and you put them back up and let them, let them do their thing. The drones are, of course, attracted to that pheromone. It's not very much pheromone. They're, you know, it's a highly potent attraction. It's the same pheromone the queen uses in the hive to suppress queen cell production and so forth. But in the open air, it acts as a sex attractor. So here's Dr. Rutner, uh, 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 yeah, Rutner, some of the students marking drones. So they've got a paint drop on the thorax to indicate what yard it's from. And they've got paint on the abdomen to indicate where they found it. So you can see they all didn't go to the same place. So, you know, they might, uh, you know, group of drones in the same hive. Some may go over to a DCA over this way, some may go to a DC over there, some back in town, one out in the field at the nature center. They spread out. They're spreading their genetic wisdom to wherever they can. But here's the interesting thing is you analyze this, you find that most colonies, the drones are staying close, they're not flying as far, and so uh, many years of study show that the drones remain near their colony. Yes, and there's lots of variation. In Mother Nature, there's always variation. So you can see that that second colony down, nearly all of the colonies, that T1, they stay close to the apiary. So that's one look at it. Another way to represent it is the queens are going a distance, the drones are staying close, 
and this one takes a minute for you to, to kind of soak in, but they actually used the same year, bee yards and mating locations for over several years in the Alps along streams. But this year they had one set of conditions were queens and drones, and they reversed it the next year. And the third year they reversed it back. And they found that in each case, drones stayed local. Queens flew a distance. So it, it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Another way to look at it, mark drones, the distance from the colony. You can see that the uh, number of drones drops at a distance. So most of them are around, what is it, 1,000 meters, I think it says. So relatively close to their hive. Again, reflecting that energy issue in terms of the amount of honey. Now, all of this puts a hive at risk. Sex for bees is risky business before movies came out. Um, a 30 years uh, set of data, also from Germany, in the mating yards that the, uh, the German beekeeper government program, with all those rules, every mating note, they know whether that queen made it or not. 30 years, northern Germany, 75% of the queens mated, 25% did not. So, apply that to your world. 75% of your colonies produce a new queen through swarming. 75% of them will have a new queen, 25% won't. And you show up late July or August and you find a colony that is swarmed and they don't have a queen. You say, what happened here? Well, maybe they were, that queen was eaten by a dragonfly or a kingbird or some other predator. Maybe it was a windy day and she went in back to, back to the wrong nest, wrong beehive in, in your mating yards. And you know, a lot of you have mating yards, you've got them in straight rows. You've got your bees, your colonies in these perfectly straight rows with all white hives. They all look identical. Those poor queens haven't got a chance. They do not stand a chance because you've screwed up with their natural system by making everything so pretty. Talk to Kathy King over here and ask her about the playing cards. We set up a few mating nukes a couple of years ago and she's going around to putting plastic coated playing cards, stapling them on the front of every one of our mating nukes because she read somewhere that the bees could recognize one through 10. <laughs> As a pattern, they're not counting, they're recognizing the pattern. Jacks, queens, and, don't, and kings not so well. Uh, so, that queen comes back with her mating sign, and there's a lot of information in this book about mating signs and what they are and how they, you know, how they function. 25% of all queens don't make it. And I think when I talk to beekeepers here in the Midwest, that's a pretty realistic data in this country. It's a good number. If you put out nukes to produce queens, You've got to produce, you've got to put out more nukes than the number you plan on selling because of this attrition, 25% loss. That's when things are, are going well. Unless you're sm hiring small children with uh, gravel in slingshots to take down the population of, of uh, dragonflies, which some of us have seriously contemplated doing, but the children want too much money. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, a dime was a big deal. And now they want to see more than a one on that, pla that paper money. They say, how about $5 a, dra a dragonfly? And I'm man, you guys are too expensive. You can talk to him out there. He's selling my books now. All right, <laughs> not really, we never had that conversation. Let's shift a little bit to queen development because this is important that you understand the, what's going, inside, going on inside the queen. 
Honeybees, again, are different than many other animals because other animals mate multiple times. Find my water. Right? Or they don't have a lifestyle. A mayfly mates once, produces eggs, and dies. Sex life of a mayfly isn't very exciting. Not nearly as complicated. Queen bee will live a couple of years, right? We hope. Ones you pay lots of money for. $800 last night for queens, isn't that what I heard? So they store that sperm. And they store it in a structure called a spermatheca. And that spermatheca is a tiny little thing. You can see it with the naked eye, not very well for some of you. I've tried to teach you some of this stuff. And uh, there's a little gland there. And Dr. Kuniger would go in and do dissections of queens, laying queens, and remove part or all of the gland. And as soon as you remove the, the gland, the gland in the, uh, in the, on the spermatheca, the sperm were dead within a couple of days. So there's something in that gland that's helping keep those sperm alive. The structure itself floats in the back end of the queen bee where the hemolymph, the, the queen's blood, is circulating around. And then that is covered with a network of trachea. The same network that the, in the chest, in the, in the, excuse me, in the thorax, you have the tracheomites living inside, very fine tubes providing oxygen. So oxygen, nutrients, probably some hormone or uh, type compound from this gland, all keep the sperm alive, not necessarily all of them. So that fine tracheal netting and the location of the spermatheca are important in keeping these bees going. So here's a cross section of a frozen spermatheca and uh, you can see the wall, the W. You can see the tracheal with the TR. You can see the D is duct. And you see the sperm, they're long sperm, with really long tails, long whips. And I don't know what Z is, but we'll figure it out. Anyway, so our queen, she comes back from her mating flight or flights. She's going to mate multiple times on one or two flights. Dr. Ellis believes that she only flies once. The Kernigers believe that she flies more than once, if necessary. But she somehow evaluates how well she's mated. We think it's the number of times she opens her sting chamber, not the number of sperm she gets. And, you know, she's producing pheromone. Even a young queen produces pheromone. Even a pupae produces pheromone. And as soon as the queen comes out, she wants to kill her sister in a, in a normal swarming type, excuse me, a normal supersedure type environment. This, this stinging behavior, you've got one good queen in the supersedure, she goes out to mate. When your bees swarm, when do the queens fight? Rich, tell me. After the virgin comes out? All right. So if you have a secondary swarm, and you're right, if, you, if, that, if, the, if the mother queen left, but if you have a secondary swarm, do those queens fight before they swarm or after? They, they fight afterwards. Again, a high-risk behavior. They get the swarm established in a new home, and then the virgins fight. I got a slide at home from a guy in England who actually shows, you know, eight queens going in and seven dead ones coming out within minutes of the bees entering the swarm. So, it, you know, whatever the moving into the, the new nest is, a, is their behavioral trigger for this, apparently. 
So, by the way, when a queen stings, she doesn't have the barb sting, but she's also stinging right in the, I call it the armpits, right at the base of the wings. There's a little member, membranous area there that you know, the bees can sting, and you know, there's even worker bees can sting other bees at that point and not uh, lose their singer. Drone mounting a queen. So here's a, a really elaborate setup that Gundren had. And you've got a rotating pole. So this really long pole with this thing flying or going around with a high-speed movie camera, the opposite end of the pole, focused on this spot. Uh, Norm Gary and other people have duplicated some of this work, but they did the work, the first of this. And so this queen is going out there. She's tethered here. So this is an artificial system. But we know that the drone mounts a queen. And as he mounts her, his endophallus goes in. And almost immediately, his thorax tightens. So all of his, to keep it simple, all his junk goes into the queen. And the sperm goes into the, the oviduct. And he falls back. And is quickly, I mean, part of him is left behind. It becomes the, the uh, mating sign. But the rest of him falls to the ground. And he'll die there in a few minutes. Carried off by the ants. So the key thing here, going back, mating lasts under two seconds. <coughs> Once this drone is done, there's another drone ready to mount her. And he's got a little hairy patch, and he uses that to pull out the endophallus from the previous drone. So each drone removes that previous drone's endophallus and is able to deal with you know, getting that out of the way so he can do his job. So what's all this going to take? Five seconds a drone? It's not a long time. So it's an amazing thing. And you can see how all these numbers, that the queen flies a distance, and she's the one that takes and spends all the hive's money eating honey, rather than sending out 2,000 drones. So the risk is the, the mating process. They're not mating inside the hive. But if they made inside, made, mated inside the hive, you'd have inbreeding. Right? Because there's no little door here, you know, gentlemen wanted. What's that, what's that, uh, that old play? Uh, arsenic and old lace, whatever it is. So anyway, uh, killing off the, the, the tenants. We don't have that. So queens apparently don't count sperm. Whew. I don't know how they figure out how to do that anyway. We think that they are measuring, that they're counting somehow probably a physiological thing the number of times they open that sting chamber and allow a drone to mate. How many sperm he carries? He has enough sperm. One drone has enough sperm for a queen. He may have five to eight million sperm, and that's enough for her for as long as she's going to live. So another thing that's happened is now the queens have learned to mate multiple times, learned in an evolutionary sense and mating an average of 15 times. So with these various uh, matings, there's a little, you talked to Sue Colby about the insemination process, there's a valve fold. Well, probably the reason the valve fold, valve fold evolved was to help keep the sperm from leaking out of a queen. She's up there in the air. She's 200 feet up. So this keeps the sperm from the previous drones inside her body. And so that when she returns to the hive, she might have 80 to 120 million sperm in her body. Now, the spermatheca holds about 5, 000, uh, 5 million sperm. So that means that all those sperm are going to be lost. And they're, as they're discharged down the oviduct, the lateral and median oviduct, the ones close to the open to that duct for the spermatheca will go into the spermatheca duct and migrate up. They'll swim up. The ones that are dead can't swim. 
just checking to see if anybody's awake here. <laughs> Such a serious crowd. I think it's because this is a chapel. If this, <laughs> if this was the room off of Bell's Brewery in Kalamazoo, it would be a lot, lot, yeah. Maybe we need to do this again tomorrow. All right, Bell's. Anyway, the oviducts expand, filled with sperm. They, some of that sperm, about 5% of it, perhaps, maybe a bit more, go into the spermatheca. And you got the mating sign there. All that has to come out. And this happens back at the hive. And the worker bees will carry out long threads of this dried sperm. And just, I don't know what they do with it. I haven't figured that one out myself. And uh, so anyway, they discard it, throw it out in the trash, take it out 50 feet and drop it. Drone development, I, I throw this in, this is the, the, the component of all of this that I've been real interested in since the mid 70s. Because you can have drones and not have sperm. And I think we face that reality on a fairly regular basis now. So there are two times in a drone's life where he has to be well fed. And when I mean well fed, give it a high protein diet. One is in the larval stage. So as soon as those drone eggs hatch, I'm not sure that's drones or not, I think it is. Those eggs hatch. They have to be fed a diet that's very rich. Royal jelly is fine, but the drone is not fed royal jelly past about 50 hours. He's fed a drone jelly, which is a mixture of this, that, but a lot of protein. If your colony has a protein deficiency during drone production time, which is going to be a couple of weeks before swarming, Colony's less likely to swarm. If you're trying to raise drones for instrumental insemination or you're trying to raise drones for open mating, that's where you have to pay some time taking care of your drones, raising good, healthy, vigorous drones. You know, you're not gonna pull those drones out and freeze them. You want them in the mating yard. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. The second time that that drone needs to have good nutrition is right after he emerges as a young male and he comes out and he has to have a lot of sperm there. And the reason for that is, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but the sperm in a drone have to migrate from the testes to the seminal, seminal vesicle, the vesicles. Because that's where the sperm has to be during that very rapid mating. You know, it's, it's a <laughs> rapid deployment. Never thought of it in that term. So you've got, the need for a lot of energy for the sperm to migrate, because that takes nutrition. So you could have well-developed, beautiful-looking drones, but if they haven't been fed well as larvae or if they haven't been fed well as young males, they could have very low or zero sperm counts. If you expose them to some of the big brand name uh, miticides, you can sterilize them. So there's another consequence. I'm pretty sure there's some environmental pesticides that, if, if tested, would be shown to affect that. Now, that migration process takes several days. So you see the days after emergence, one through 15 here, that you get your maximum of about between the 12th and 13th day. So how how old the drone do you want to have mating with your queens? Some that are at least 13 days old. Two weeks. So all those drones you're, you're complaining about inside your beehive, you say, look, they're not doing anything. My argument is, yeah, they're ripening, they're, they're migrating sperm right now. You just can't see it. You just can't see what's going on, the physiology part. They start flying out of five or seven days, and those are cleansing flights. Those are orientation flights, because they're short flights. See the lower line of uh, diamonds? It isn't until they get to about uh, 
12 days that they start flying and then their, their first mating flights might only be 15, 14, 15 minutes. As they mature, they get up to that 25, 30 minute interval. You get a little more confidence, a little more swagger, know the, know the terrain a little bit better, know the bartender's name, I don't know what it is. So here's, here's one of the things that I want, I want this bit to stick with you. It takes about 10,000 drones to maintain a good drone congregation areas, area, one area. And I want you to go out today or tomorrow and count the number of drones in one colony, say about nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Because if you go out this afternoon, a lot of your drones will be flying. Drones fly in the afternoon, queens fly in the afternoon here in this part of the world. Different species, species like the Borneo, they're different, different times of the day. That's how the, the Kernigers found it. They keep, keep things straight. One species may fly in the morning, the other one at noon, the other one in the early afternoon, blah, blah, blah. So, 10,000 drones, where are they? Where are they coming from? You just spent $800 last night in Queens, and you don't know what they're going to mate with, who have they mated with, unless you've used instrumental insemination. So these are things that we have a lot of questions about. Uh, oh, I didn't know I was there already. Okay, all right. So, more on that, I'm not done. 15,000 drones to maintain 10,000 out flying. Why? The flight time, back and forth, the refueling time. If you have to have 15,000 drones for one drone congregation area, and if you're in any kind of beekeeping territory, there are going to be multiple drone congregation areas near you. Are, we, are you doing the balloon thing today? No. You're not? Okay. We talked about, you know, walking the grounds of the campus with balloons this afternoon looking for drones. You can do that at home. You do get a few questions from the neighbors. <laughs> Invite them to help. Just go out with a fishing line and the balloon and the pheromone and just tell them you're fishing for drones. It's really what you're doing. So it can be fun. A great thing to do as a bee club with kids at camp. It teaches a lot of biology of what's going on there. And you just want to, and then you can lower this down and you can, you know, get some insect nets, try to catch a few, build one of those fancy nests, those traps. These are all things that can be done to capture a large number of drones. Now, We've been on and off about a talk this afternoon. I'm off the hook on that. Just found that out. Thank you, Rich. I was going to talk a little bit about strategies for mating. I got a few people here that uh, we've talked about this before. And one of the things that I'm excited to see are programs like the uh, our Anybody from the ankle biter crew here? The, uh, we've got Dwight, I can't, I can't see you. Joe, who else is in back there? Okay, I want you two guys stand up. Greg, Crispin, stand up. These are the guys that have started this, this whole leg tour. Ankle biters isn't quite right, is it? Because they don't have ankles, thank you. Um, you can sit down anytime you want, but. Uh, <laughs> These guys kind of quietly have contacted beekeepers in Indiana, got a couple of people from Ohio with uh, Joe and uh, Dwight. We got a few people in Michigan that have developed this, this idea of we're gonna bring in different stock and we're gonna inseminate them from drones of this Lake Tour stock. And they can go home and produce queens from it. Now this is, we think, I, I'm not sure, and Greg and I, you know, Greg and I have something to add here, that 
the leg chewing behavior is different from hygienic behavior. I don't think it's the same set of alleles. They're different. So you have a different mechanism at work. So my argument, quite simply, and I've, I've, I've done a, a couple of articles on this, my argument is so let's take something from back, from my old, old, old V work with the Starline. Because Bud Kale developed a way of producing breeder queens for commercial beekeepers. Now, there's a bit of an oxymoron there breeder queen commercial because commercial beekeepers ain't got no time for that they don't want to sit down so Bud Kale developed a technique when he was the geneticist trained at, under the corn geneticist in Iowa developed the hybrid corn he developed the same system with hybrid honeybees but to maintain a hybrid honeybee in the star line and later the midnight you had to have separate breeder queens. And the easy way to do that is that every year you send them on a, a different breeder queen. All right? Question? Five minutes. Okay, thank you. So by alternating breeder queens, you set out one set this year. Next year you set out another set of breeder queens. They're not related. But if you produce drones from the first year, the second year, I got a thousand colonies of bees. I'm Richard Eighty. I've got seventy-eight thousand colonies of bees. If I put use those for producing new queens, put those thousands of thousands of colonies that have daughters from the first year, producing drones, they mate with the second year breeder queen. The second year, that group of colonies they've been requeened. That they only last one year. They produce drones for the third year. It's called a crisscross program. So what we have here, and I'm throwing this out, I have no data, but I would like to see the ankle biter, leg chewer, bite the mite type behavior in crisscross arrangement with John Harbo and other of Roa sensitive hygienic, Minnesota, because that's a different set of, of genes. I'd like to see them in alter, alter, you know, alternating. And I don't know what the result's going to be, but you're going to now start to concentrate in Ohio, in Michigan, in Indiana, and other states, West Virginia. You're going to start concentrating on only having bees with some type of resistance in them, or tolerance to varroa mites. And I think that when we plug this into the work that people like the Kernigers have done, we can now start thinking about getting away from chemicals altogether and using genetic control for our colonies and having vigorous colonies that survive the winter, survive the summer, and produce honey. Uh, they may be ankle biters, but they don't bite mine.